Hello, and welcome to the online streaming of Olive Branch Baptist Church for May 15th. We're glad you're tuning in. For the call of worship today, I would like to share with you Psalms 13:6, where the psalmist says this, But I trust in your mercy. Grant my heart joy in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. He has dwelt bountiful with me. As we prepare to worship the Lord together today, I have just a few announcements to start with. First of all, this Friday, Pat will be taking a group of volunteers up to set up some tents at Westport Church Camp. If you are interested in volunteering, please let Pat know. But once again, that's this Friday to set up tents for their homecoming weekend. On July 3rd, we will be having our Independence Day service. At this service, we take up a special love offering to help pay towards our mortgage. But even more exciting is we're also going to have baptisms that Sunday. If baptism is something that's been laying on your heart, or maybe you're just not sure about how baptism works for us, please feel free to reach out to us. We would love to have that conversation with you. We are excited and we are anticipatory of God showing up big in July. So just reach out and let us know if you'd like to talk about that more. Also on June 5th, we're gonna be honoring the graduates. If you are a graduate or if you have someone who has graduated high school or college and you would like them to be honored in service, please reach out to Pat and let us know. Also on Thursday, we've started the OB Rangers program. This is for kids, um, the youngest of young, all the way up to high school students to come, to be outdoors, to eat hot dogs and to learn about Jesus. This starts Thursdays from 6.30 to 7.30 and we would love for a big turnout. So please consider coming, bringing your kids, your grandkids, we'd love to have the whole family. During that time, we also have a women's Bible study going from 6.30 to 7.30. So moms can bring their kids, your kids can have something to do, and then us women can get together and learn about Jesus. We're going through a study called Get Out of Your Head. It's by Jeannie Allen, and it's been wonderful so far. So we would love to have you. Also, we have Bible study on Wednesdays at 630. There are plenty of opportunities to plug in outside of these church walls on Sunday, and we would love to have you join us. If you have any questions, of course, of course you can always reach out and let us know. One thing that I want to move to next is just reminding us that a part of worship is prayer. By going to prayer, we are praising the Lord. We are telling him that here's our request, and we just know that you hear them, and we are grateful for that. So my question is, what prayer concerns do you have today? What would you like us to lift up to you, to, to Jesus? If you have any and you would like to let us know, you can always message me, Courtney Kindler, or you can also message Pat, and we would love to add them to our list. The people on our list today, we have Jean Weissman had surgery this week, so we want to pray for, pray for Jean. Um, Amy Davies continues to heal from her surgeries that she has, so we want to pray for healing for her. George Poling also had a heart surgery this week. And then we have several people who have been on our prayer list for a couple of weeks, but we always want to speak life into their names. So we have Bud Van, who is battling cancer. Jill Cooley continues to battle pancreatic cancer. Marilyn Reed has just general health concerns, along with Emerson Brooks. And then Chelsea McClellan and Baby, we just continue to pray for her that she'll be able to make it to term. We do want to take a moment to just pray for the unspoken things, the things that we hold in our heart that they're hard to say out loud. We know that God hears them even when it's hard to say them, and for that we're grateful. Why don't you pray with me today? Dear God, I just thank you that we can gather together in whatever venue this is, Lord, here in church or online, Lord. We just thank you that you are almighty lord that you are good and you work things out for good lord i just pray for the names on this prayer list for the ones that have been there for a while and the ones that are new lord i just pray that you be with each specific person you just intercede lord that you be present with them and with their family and just give them the peace and the hope that only you can give lord we are thankful for you. We are grateful that you love us and that you continue to put your hand of blessing upon us. Lord, last but not least, we want to pray for Pat as he leads this church. Lord, I just ask that you put a hand of blessing upon him and that, that the congregation will continue to grow closer to you. We pray that all we say and all we do would be used for your glory, Lord. In your precious name we pray. Amen. If everybody will please stand. We're going to continue singing with holy is the Lord. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We 
bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he, and together we sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with his glory. stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength we bow down and worship him now how great how awesome is he and together we sing everyone sing Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory.
my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. David, would you please pray for us? As you came in this morning, if you were one of the winners of our drawing, you received a prize, right? You received a pencil. Did you receive your pencil? Everybody's got it? Okay, great. Um, if, if you did not, for some reason, if we missed you, uh, you can uh, raise your hand and we'll get you one, or you can get one on the way out. Um, I was telling them earlier, uh, several years ago, uh, Chiquita was involved in some stuff at school, and she said, can you go get the stuff to hand out for kids for trick-or-treat? Halloween. I said, sure. So I happened to be in, at that time, Swiss Alps printing. And I thought, you know what would be really cool is to give kids pencils. Um, so I bought all these pencils. And I got home and Jaquita said, did you get the candy? I said, better. I got pencils. And as, as a person who's taught six-year-olds for 38 years, she looked at me and she said, do you really enjoy living here? Because like, Kids are going to burn our house down. Um, and uh, so then she went and got the candy, which she should have done anyway. And, uh, and I don't have to go candy shopping anymore. So guys, that might be a tip for you if you don't want to do that. Um, you will also notice this morning uh, that they are each pretty much perfectly sharpened. Um, it took me weeks to get that just right. Uh, actually, Amazon took care of that for me. Um, so... Um, so here's a question this morning, and, and don't let it stump you. Um, what do we use a pencil for? Really, it, it's not a trick question. We, we, we use it to write things down, right? Um, we, we use them to, to do math and things we don't like, and then uh, and, and make lists and things like that. Um, if, if you're left-handed like me, and we'll get to left-handers in a minute, the thought of using a pencil sends you into a panic because uh, as, as we wrote in school, right, lefties, any left, left-handed people in here? As you wrote in school, right, it went across, and, and writing with a pencil gave you this big black mark down your arm. So um, you, you might have, you know, there might be some therapy involved in getting a pencil this morning. But um, like I said, there, there are... There are different things we use pencils for. And in general, what you do is you might use a pencil to write your story, uh, to write your autobiography, the, the story of your life. Um, you might use that to write your story. Um, and like I said, if, if you're left-handed this morning, um, I was always told that everybody's born left-handed. You become right-handed when you commit your first sin. So uh, if, uh, if you are a lefty this morning, you're safe. Um, so, uh, but we'll get to that later too. Um, we have several scriptures this morning, and, but we're going to start with one from the Old Testament that features one of the most famous men in biblical history. Um, it's found in Exodus chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn. Uh, it's the second chapter in your Bible after Genesis. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles with you this morning, um, you can see it up on the screen. And we are going to be in Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, 
and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and laid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. So ends the reading of God's word. Join me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for this day. I, I thank you for the opportunity to look at your word. I, I thank you for the opportunity to be a member of this, of this church family, this great fellowship of believers. Uh, we ask uh, that all we do today bring glory to you. I ask a blessing upon those members of our church family who could not be with us this morning, that you would keep them safe. Father, we, we love you. We're honored by your presence here. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. So this morning I gave you a pencil and then I read you a scripture about Moses killing a guy. So I guess I can stop the message here because obviously you have it all figured out, right? Um, so let's play a game. If, if I gave you, um, uh, if we gave Moses a pencil, if it was possible to go back and we gave Moses a pencil and we asked him to write the story of his life, he would write about being born in secret and being placed in a basket and placed by the river only to be found by Pharaoh's daughter, right? He, he'd talk about living in the palace even though he knew he truly wasn't one of them. And at, at some point Moses would tell this story. What I didn't read to you is that after sitting by that well, Moses encounters the seven daughters of a man named Ruel who was a priest and the girls had come to water their father's flock, but a group of shepherds had run them off and wouldn't allow them near the well. So Moses went and watered the flock for them. And, and when the daughters all returned home, they, they told their dad about this man that had helped them and Ruel told them to go and find him and invite him to supper. And, and it's from that, Moses agrees to, to go to work for Ruel. And at some point, he marries one of his daughters, uh, Zipporah, and, and they have a son, Gershom. And at that point, Moses settles into this new life, a, a life that he will live for the next 40 years. Now, if Moses is writing his story, we'd all guess that at this point, he'd take his pencil and he'd put a period there, right? That's the end of my story. Made a mistake, killed a guy, they found out about it, I ran away, I met some people, married a woman, had a kid, and I'm living this life as a shepherd. That's the story of my life, period. His story had ended at that point. This is his life. But there's a great part about a pencil. It has an eraser on the end of it, right? So when you make a mistake, you can simply erase it and write down the correct information, right? Well, I believe that when Moses finished his story and dotted that final sentence with period, at some point God stepped in and changed that period to a comma. Because in God's eyes, the story of Moses wasn't over. In fact, it was just getting started. So with that, let's move forward a few chapters, uh, a few chapters in the Bible to 2 Samuel, a few books in the Bible, I guess. The 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. 
One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace, and from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone out to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. As she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness, then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now most of us have heard that story, right? David is king and he has wealth beyond measure and whatever he says goes. He has unquestioned authority. And we learn here that David has sent his troops out to go to war and and he's back at the palace and he's wandering around the roof one night because he can't sleep when he sees this woman, Bathsheba, and she's taking a bath. And the text says that she was very beautiful and David wanted more information and soon after that he finds out that she's married and she's married to this man named Uriah and, and he's a member of David's army and he's actually off at war. Now David can't help himself and he sends for Bathsheba and he sleeps with her and then a little later she has a message for the king, I'm pregnant. Oops. Now let's all remember David is the unquestioned king. Whatever he said was law. So as we look at this from the outside, he can simply take her into the palace and let her have the child. He can ignore her and let the chips fall where they may. But instead, David, the king of all he knew, devised a plan to cover his sin. First, he sends word to the war to allow Uriah to come home for some R&R. Surely after being away for so long, he certainly will want to spend some time with his wife, right? Except Uriah is such a good soldier, he refuses to go into his house. And instead, he sleeps outside the palace instead of going home. So plan A doesn't work. So David's plan B is... He sends Uriah back to the war, carrying orders to Joab, and those orders tell Joab, instruct Joab, to put Uriah on the front line in the thick of the battle, a place where he is almost certain to be killed. And he was. So you might say David committed murder in a different sort, right? David's attempt to cover up his sin results in the death of an innocent man. So anyway, David moves Bathsheba into the palace. And soon she gives birth to David's son. So check out 2 Samuel chapter 11 verses 26 and 27. It's going to be up there. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought into his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The thing David had done displeased the Lord. See, he had hid it from society, but he couldn't hide it from God. So in the next chapter, chapter 12, we're not going to put it up there, but just to give you some information. In the next chapter, this man named David, or named Nathan, he confronts David about his sin. And he tells him that the Lord knows about David's sin. But the Lord has decided not to kill David over David's sin. But the son and, that David and Bathsheba were having, he's going to die. 
And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 18, that's exactly what happens. All of that to cover up the sin, and at the end of the day, the, the innocent result of that sin dies. So let's give David a pencil and ask him to write his story. He'll write about facing Goliath. And he'll write about running from King Saul. And he'll write about all of the riches and land and fame that he had amassed. That's my granddaughter. Raspberries for Papaw. He'll write about all of that and then he'll write this part of his story. So put yourself in David's sandals. At this point, we'd probably put a period, right? It's over. All of these things, it's all over. Messed up. It's the end of my story. See, we would put a period there, but God didn't. Again, I, I believe that God erased the period and somehow replaced it with a comma. Because David is going to continue to do great things for God and with the help of God. And ultimately, David and Bathsheba are going to have a second son and they're going to name him Solomon, who we have come to be taught was the wisest man who ever lived. And David himself... Well, in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 22, in the New Testament, we see this. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, you may have heard people say that all the time, right? David was a man after God's own heart. What do you know about David? Well, he fought Goliath and he's a man after God's own heart. But look what it says here in Acts. The person who says David was a man after God's own heart was God himself. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Mine. That's not a declaration and that's not a title made by somebody else looking at him and deciding that he must have been really in good with God. That's a testimony by God telling you that this is, what, this is how much he meant to me. A man after my own heart. Who at some point if he'd have been writing his story... When he got to that I'm pregnant part and then the child dies, he's probably going to put a period there. Because in his mind, in his eyes, it's over. It's the end of my story. And there are so many other examples in Scripture. Noah saves humanity, right? And when he finally gets off the ark, he builds a vineyard and got passed out drunk. But God remained faithful to Noah and his descendants through all of that. Peter tells Jesus, all these other guys might leave you, but I never will. I'll die with you if I need to. But in the temple court on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, Peter couldn't even stand up to a little girl who thought she recognized him. But on the shore of a lake one morning, Jesus made Peter and the others breakfast. And he restored Peter. And later in Acts, it's Peter who preaches a sermon in which 3,000 people get saved. How about that? 
And then there's Paul, who we talk about a lot. High-ranking and powerful and rich and pretty scary. He had everything that the world could offer except Jesus in his heart. And that all changed on the road that he was walking to in order to hunt down people, imprison people, and probably kill Jesus followers. Back then, we were called members of the way. Which is really cool when Jesus says, I am the way, right? But from that moment on, for more than 30 years, Paul moves across the known world telling people about Jesus and introducing them to others who knew about Jesus too. And eventually the Romans killed Paul by cutting off his head because that was the most uh, uh, humane way to do that. But through it all, Paul remained faithful. But in all of those instances, at some point, they're going to pick up their pencil when they're writing their story and they're going to put that period right there. It's over. So let's put the pencils in the hands of those men and many others. How do you think their stories went? Can you see those moments when they probably place a period and thought, oh, well, I screwed up. I guess that's all over now. See, family, the Bible is filled with stories like these. Stories of real human people who made mistakes. And they did the best they could. They fell short. And at some point, they probably thought that a, a period had been placed at the end of their story. It's over. Messed up. So what about your story? Don't raise your hands. But I'm guessing that for nearly every one of us, there is a moment in our past or maybe a moment in our present when we feel like we just put a period on the end of our story. That it had ended and we were done and God was walking away shaking his head. What a pity. We've all had that moment. I have. Truthfully, more than one. But what if, what if that period got erased? What if God just simply replaced it with a comma instead? He tells us all that, uh, that we all need to consider to be what we consider to be our story, your story. It's not the whole story. God has and had bigger and better plans. And the only thing holding you back is, well, you. I mean, look at your pencil for a minute if you still got it out. If you use it, and after this, they'll be very valuable. You'll be able to sell these on eBay, I'm sure. If you use it, what part, if you use a pencil, what part of it typically wears out first? The eraser, right? Wears out the fastest. It's the part that goes away most quickly. Now, why is that? Have you ever sat down to write something or to do some math and thought, I'm going to mess this up on purpose? Right here, I'm going to make a mistake that will throw everything off. Of course not. But there's an eraser on the end of your pencil anyway. You don't tend to make mistakes, but you pick it up knowing 
in some likelihood you're going to make one. Because when it comes to pencils, our erasers wear away much more quickly than the pencil does. It's a tool designed for writing. But in its design is a component that allows you to fix your mistakes when you make one. But there are people out there who feel like they wrote their whole story in pen. It's an, it's an ink, not graphite. And there's no erase in that, Pat. I wrote my story in pen. The best thing we can do is, is scribble over it and then write down the correct answer next to our mess, right? I used to do math and pen because I didn't like having the whole side of my arm black. And I made a mess out of some math papers in my life because all I could do is scribble that part out and write it over here. And everybody knew I made a mistake because it was right there. If I'd have used a pencil, I could have erased it and written in the right one, but instead, no, I gotta cross that out. And in those cases, those are, those are sort of like scars, aren't they? That scribble indicates to everyone that at some point something went wrong. And you can't hide that. But in all honesty, I think God likes our scribbles. I think he's okay with our scars because it shows that we didn't stay with the original answer. When we knew what was right, we changed it. We may have left a mark behind showing how it used to be, but what's important is that we can see now that what we've done is right. And then there's some people out there who feel like they wrote their whole story with a permanent Sharpie marker. And that's never going away. Never. It's here forever. It's not in pencil and it's not in pen. It's in dark, black, permanent Sharpie marker. Folks, I believe that when we write our stories in marker and we come to think that there's nothing that can change it, I truly believe that that's when Satan is whispering more lies into our ears. Because I truly think in our hearts, it's not us who don't think we can change it. I think it's Satan standing there going, that thing you did a couple years ago, that thing you did 20 years ago, that thing you did yesterday, that's never going away. And there's nothing that you can do to change it because I'm constantly going to be in your ear reminding you of it. You can write it in permanent laundry marker. God can change it. And here's the great thing about pencil erasers. When you wear one out, they make brand new ones that you can simply push on top of your pencil, right? And keep right on writing your story. I wrote and I made mistakes and I erased those mistakes and I did what was right so many times that my eraser's gone. And God goes, here, have a new eraser. Keep writing your story. God's grace is like that for his family. See, just when we think we're out of a racer, God steps in and puts on a new one. Because ultimately, our story is really God's story. It's a story of falling down and feeling lost. It's a story of falling short and giving into sin. It's a story that as we are writing it, 
doesn't have a fairy tale ending. At least one like we had always hoped it would. But in God's story, we are a story of falling down and picking ourselves up. We're a story of being lost and then being found. We're a story of falling short and trying again. We're a story of giving into sin and then being redeemed from the penalty of that sin. See, you may think your past ended your story. But it's at times like those when God steps in, erases your past, and helps you write a new permanent one. A future with him. Don't give up on your story. Because just when you think it's over, God's going to reach down and he's going to go, no, it's not over. We're going to put a comma right there. And then we're going to do great things together. And just think, you thought all you were going to get this morning was a crummy pencil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just... Uh, Thank you for this day. We, I thank you for these words. Father, I thank you that you are a God of many things. And one of the great things that you are for us is that you are a forgiving God who provides us with erasers over and over and over again in our lives. Father, we talk about when you say your son in scripture says, go and sin no more, there is a... There's a command there not to sin anymore, but there's also an understanding that in order for him to say that, we had to sin in the first place. None of us is perfect and we aren't supposed to be because you gave us the only one who ever will be. Father, look past our worn erasers that we have used on our lives. Look past the scribbles and the scars that we have left behind. Look, behind, look past all of those things and, and see our hearts that we like Moses and David and all of the others are flawed human beings and the one thing we all share in common is that we all fell short and that's okay because you expected us to that's why you sent your son Father, if there's somebody in this room today who feels like there's a period at the end of their story and, and there's no getting away with that, I ask that you speak to their heart this morning and you say, no, 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 that's not the end. In fact, that's only the beginning. Give me your heart and watch the great things that happen from this point on. Father, if there's somebody in this room today who needs to do that, they feel like I just made these mistakes and I'm never, God's never going to want me. Help them to help them to feel in their heart very clearly this morning that, that you want them more than anything. That you want to take all those periods they put in their lives and you want to change them to commas and move us forward to, for your glory. Father, if there's somebody in this room today who needs to rededicate themselves to you, if there's somebody in this room today who needs to to pray or, or join in the fellowship of this church. Whatever you're calling on us to do today, Father, I just ask that we would be obedient to your call. Father, we love you. We're honored by your presence in this room with us. And we ask these things in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. I'm going to ask some of our prayer team to stand up. And if you don't feel like you... Uh, can, uh, you don't feel like you want to come up here, Melissa, are you back there? And uh, if you don't feel like you want to come up here and talk to me, they are around this room and they want to pray with you and pray for you. But uh, let's all just stand and as we sing our hymn of invitation today, allow the Lord to speak to our hearts.
Amen. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, we're going to have a, a business meeting, uh, if you can stay for that. Um, it's supposed to be a beautiful day, at least uh, until late tonight. I think we're supposed to get some more rain, but we're not going to worry about that. We're going to enjoy the day God gives us, right? Um, don't forget all the things going on this week. Uh, Tom's Bible study on Wednesday, uh, OB Rangers for Kids on Thursday, Melissa's Women's Bible study on Thursday. Um, if you can help, uh, if you can help me take the, the tents out and set them up on Friday, I would appreciate the help. And uh, just all the other things going on. Uh, it's a busy time, getting ready to graduate some seniors and, and uh, um, busy time for everybody. And, and uh, I'm, we're just blessed that, that people took a little time to, to gather here today. Um, we, uh, um, I'm gonna ask Adam if he would close us in a word of prayer. And then after that, we'll be singing our doxology and then you are dismissed. Have a blessed day. Amen. Sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Have a blessed week.